my name is Corey Olson, and today is session number 248. Sorry, I'm using a kind of a mock serious tone because this is actually the second, maybe second and a half time I've started here this evening. Been experiencing some technical problems, but I think we've worked them out and all should be well. Uh, anyway, today we resume being on the slopes of Karathras, somewhere further up, but probably not that much further up than the knees of Karathras, uh, as we uh, continue the climb, though not very far before things start getting sketchy. Um, so we shall resume the sketchiness today. And today, I, as I, I'm really excited about today's discussion, when I can actually succeed in getting the stream going and actually doing it, because uh, tonight we're going to get to finally talk about the mountain. Um, I've been sort of avoiding the question of the identity of Karathras and the spirit of Karathras and what's going on there. Um, and I've been waiting really for this passage and the passage that comes after. I think in those we'll be able to see some uh, some pretty clear indicators well, clues anyway. Uh, Tolkien's not very explicit about this, at least certainly not in the published text. Um, he was a little bit more explicit in the draft texts, and then, as was his wont, um, cut out detail. Um, that's a, a, a general tendency you can see when you uh, look at Tolkien's drafts, like if you're reading The Return of the Shadow and The Treason of Isengard and, and The War of the Ring from, uh, from the History of Middle-Earth series. Uh, you can see that uh, one of the consistent tendencies is that Tolkien tends to sort of overwrite and overexplain um, when he's writing a first draft. And then when he's going back and revising it, he tends to take out a lot of that detail. And one of the hard things, of course, is trying to figure out when you go through and see that Tolkien took something out. Did he take it out because he no longer, because it's not true anymore, because he changed his mind about it? Or did he just take it out because he didn't, he thought it worked better not to explain that explicitly? Um, and a lot of this, this is one of the things that Christopher Tolkien is very good about reminding us in his editorial commentaries uh, on that material uh, to remember that just because Tolkien took something out, you know, removed something from one draft to the next doesn't necessarily mean that that's a rejected idea uh, explicitly. So anyway, that's we're going to kind of get into the the Karathras question, uh, which I've been pushing off a little bit. Um, but, in any case, um, before we go too much deeper in that, I wanted to do a couple of announcements, because I have a series, a little series of announcements today. shouldn't take too long, but um, first, for those of you who are with me uh, live in Discord, Discord, our Signum University Discord server is where, um, you know, when you hear me interacting with people on a weekly basis, um, we... Um, uh, I, I, it is the, the folks who are live here in the Signum Discord that I'm interacting with. Uh, there is always a good crowd, well, always a good crowd, and frequently a very numerous crowd as well here uh, joining me on Tuesday nights. Um, always appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, But for those of you who are in the Discord server, you will notice that we've just recently expanded our Discord server. Um, more of the different elements of Signum University are going to be coming and joining our Discord server um, and uh, going to be uh, using it in different ways. So if you you may have noticed when you logged in tonight that there are a whole bunch of new, uh, new channels uh, that are up and new sections that are up, in particular several about space. Um, a bunch of people in our space program, a bunch of the students in our space program, have been expressing interest in being in a space Discord server where they can talk together. People who are taking our space modules or who are interested in our space modules to have a place where they can discuss stuff uh, together, which I think is awesome. So um, we have worked to expand um, the... Um, we have, we have worked to expand the... Uh, uh, our, our, our server here and our menus. And so if you if you come to our Discord server at Signum, you can see uh, the different space places there. And seeing all the space places reminds me of, this is our space page. Um, there are a whole bunch of, man, we have more modules being offered in January than we ever have before. Like we have, it's like a 
30% more modules than we've ever offered in a single month before. Um, so if you scroll down on our space page to the BlackBerry section, BlackBerry is of course the registration system that we use for space. You can see the full module directory. Uh, you can get the view the, the, the modules for the current ones that are going on right now, the ones that are confirmed for January, and the candidates that are offered for February. So if you click, this is our list. This is in BlackBerry, of course, our list of the, uh, the February modules. You can see the ones coming up, really, really awesome stuff. Um, uh, <laughs> I love the, um, uh, we're doing advanced old English readings. Uh, we've been doing those for a long time now, for over a year, uh, for people who read old English and would like to continue reading it. Uh, the unexpected text, uh, that is going to be read in old English this month is going to be Alice in Wonderland actually, which is pretty awesome. Um, uh, anyway, there's all kinds of fun things uh, that are happening here in February and January. Two things I wanted to mention in particular. One, this January, you know, so starting next month is going to be the beginning. Uh, so James Taubert is beginning a, a large undertaking where he's going to go through the entire 12 volume history of Middle Earth month by month and, you know, over the entire year of 2023. Uh, so he's going to do a volume a month marching through the history of Middle Earth, um, which is going to be really, really cool. And we have more people uh, doing that module than we've ever had doing a single module before in space come January. But there's still room for more. We in invite anybody who wants to, to do this. If you've, if you've long wanted to get through the history of Middle Earth, but you found it dry reading and you would like to do it in company and under the expert guidance, not only of James, but there will be other teachers who will be involved that you'll be connected with. You'll be in uh, not only in discussions with James, but also in discussions with two of our wonderful preceptors, Sarah Brown and Tom Hillman. Um, so it's a really, really great opportunity. So that's in, in January, they're going to do Book of Lost Tales, Volume 1, moving on to Book of Lost Tales, Volume 2. This is the, the journey through the history of Middle-earth, the Book of Lost Tales, Part 2, coming up there in February. The other one I wanted to mention is a new module that we're doing called Video Game Studies. So Wesley Schantz is teaching. Um, if you attended the uh, the webathon that I did in the middle of November at the end of the fundraising campaign, um, Wesley did the uh, did a little uh, space capsule uh, on his video game studies uh, module. So he's doing a video game studies module in January. It's going to be really really neat. Um, this is one of the first ones of our um, what we're hoping to expand into more modules on video games, more academic study of video games, which I think will be a really really fun thing uh, to do uh, to do in space. So, just wanted to, uh, to draw your particular attention to that. That's starting in a couple weeks, but there's still plenty of time to enroll. JJ, you're taking that. Awesome. It should be cool. It should be cool. Uh, Wes is really neat. Um, he's a great teacher, and I think it'll be a, I, I, I think that'll be a really, a really fun class. Um, uh, and then, but then of course, while you're in BlackBerry, you might notice like, hey, not only is there all this awesome space stuff, we also have our university press stuff in here too, because today is a big day for the university press because we have our first book available for subscription, for monthly subscription. So you may remember when I said we were doing the press long ago, a uh, month ago now, I said that we're going to have books that are going to be released serially, right? just like Charles Dickens, you know. Um, uh, so you'll be able to, to, to read a book in progress, chapter by chapter. Um, we're we're, we're going to release them serially so that you can read them as they're being developed. Um, the very first one that we have is uh, Serena Higgins' wonderful collection of stories, A Handful of Hazelnuts. Um, and that's going to be released story by story, month by month um, here uh, for, the next, for the next year or so. Um, and so the subscriptions are open for that now. So if you subscribe for uh, $2 a month or $2.50 a month, you can get, um, you can get ebook chapters of that every, uh, every month as that book is released. If you wanted to be more involved, to be able to meet with Serena and give her feedback and, and, and be a little bit more uh, directly involved in the writing process, you can, of course, join her author circle. Um, several of us who are publishing in the press have author circles available. Um, I am um, even today working on something uh, to send to my own author circle, which I have loved meeting with, and I can't, to, I can't wait to meet with them again at the end of this month. Um, so I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to be communicating with them here in just the next few days uh, with some new stuff. Um, 
but this is so this is the really simple subscription model two bucks a month it's really cheap and you get access to the book as it goes along as well as then uh the final finished copy uh when the book is completed there at the end um so i had mentioned this sort of subscription model that we were going to be doing at the press and uh, that is now actual that is now happening and i'm really excited to see that happening so okay all those things you can get through blackberry now let us get back to Karathras here. All right. Gandalf halted. Snow was thick on his hood and shoulders. It was already ankle deep about his boots. This is what I feared, he said. What do you say now, Aragorn? That I feared it too, Aragorn answered, but less than other things. I knew the risk of snow, though it seldom falls so heavily so far south, save high up in the mountains. But we are not high yet. We are still far down where the paths are usually open all the winter. I wonder if this is a contrivance of the enemy, said Boromir. They say in my land that he can govern the storms in the mountains of shadow that stand upon the borders of Mordor. He has strange powers and many allies. His arm has grown long indeed, said Gimli, if he can draw snow down from the north to trouble us here three hundred leagues away. His arm has grown long, said Gandalf. Okay. All right. So, the two elements, there's sort of two major sections that I want to look at here in this passage. First, the exchange between Gandalf and Aragorn. Because unlike the rest of the party, that is, the rest of the party who are not named Gandalf, Aragorn, or Frodo, um, we have access to some context here, right? Um, and uh, this is a new thing. Now, of course, the second part is the kind of open debate, right, of, uh, of, what's, of what's going on here. Um, oh, man. Uh, Nancy is remembering the It's Saruman line from, from the movie I Am Too. I laughed so hard when, in the theater when I saw that because I'm thinking of this passage, right? Um, the fact that they took a passage like this, where it's this like mystery and nobody really knows for sure, like what do you think would be happening? I'm not really sure, right? And that they started off that way, right? Like you know, it, it sounded like because I the way they begin that scene, I totally expected them to be, you know, uh, playing out the same kind of like, we're going to make some ominous hints, but not say for sure. Right. And then all of a sudden Gandalf says, it's Saruman. And I'm like, wait, really? <laughs> anyway. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah. OK. So. But first, before we get we'll, we'll come back to Boromir uh, Bjorning. But first, I want to. Focus on the on that first section, right? Um, what do you say now, Aragorn? Um, and I love the question uh, somebody was asking before. Um, oh yeah, Zephan was saying, how many times in their friendship do you think Gandalf has asked Aragorn, what say you now? <laughs> what do you say now? Um, uh, probably quite a few. That kind of sounds like a Gandalfism, doesn't it? Um, it's a... Uh, it's not exactly I told you so, but it's pretty close to I told you so, right? Fourth Dauntless is imagining with some fairness that the question has probably gone the other way, too. It's possible. It's possible. Um, uh, the most noticeable thing to me is not just that Gandalf is asking that question, right? It's not just that Gandalf is sort of t saying I told you so. To Aragorn. Um, but, um, and when he says, this is what I feared, he's not only alluding to their private conversation, right? Um, he is alluding to the fact that, I mean, he had just said this. He had just said this to everybody. Remember that kind of downer speech that he gives them, right? That unpep talk that he gives them before they set out to climb the mountain. Um, about uh, how bad the weather looks and how they're all probably going to die. Uh, the thing that s inspired Boromir to interrupt and suggest they bring wood. Um, so he's not 
at first, my first impulse when I read this is to think like, whoa, Gandalf is now suddenly going public with their debate. Like he's kind of outing the fact, right, that uh, that he and Aragorn have been debating about this. Um, but not really, because again, he had just stated those fears very openly more recently than we heard him debating with Aragorn. Um, the one hint at the existence of that previous debate is his what do you say now Aragorn, right? He's acknowledging that Aragorn had said something about like he, he's kind of there openly laying the responsibility on Aragorn. Like it's this, this is totally it's totally Aragorn's fault that we're up here. Right. Um, uh, so that's the one thing that he is sort of exposing here. What do you say now, Aragorn? Um, implied since it was your bright idea for us to come up here uh, in the first place. Um, Aragorn's answer, that I feared it too, but less than other things. But less than other things. That's a wonderful line because, of course, we know so much more than everybody else, right? On the one hand, to, any, to everyone else, it sounds like a perfectly relevant, ominous comment, right? Yeah, okay. Like, I, I knew something bad could happen up here, but it's not as bad as other things. I mean, I'm sure their own imaginations can supply them uh, with other worse things that might have happened in other Op with other options um, without even knowing about the dark and secret way that Gandalf is suggesting. But of course, for us, we have, we know the context. And the line that I think this sentence by Aragorn inescapably evokes is his begging Gandalf, say nothing to the others, I beg. Right? Um... And I think that that's, I think that he is still signaling to Gandalf in that sentence. Um, like, it, one response to what do you say now, Aragorn, is, yes, I acknowledged that you told me that the snow might lead us to disaster up here, but please don't bring up Moria yet still. Seems to me, it's one of the things that I am hearing there. Um, uh, yeah, that I feared it too, but less than other things that shall remain unnamed, right? Um, I knew the risk of snow, though it seldom falls heavily so far south, save high up in the mountains. But we're not high yet. We're still far down, where the pads are usually open all the winter. On the one hand, you know, this... Like, how do we read this? What's going on here? Now, if we were uncharitable, we could read this uncharitably as um, Aragorn making excuses, right? Like, well, don't blame me. Like, I, I, you know, this appears to be some kind of freak storm. Aragorn is emphasizing this is not just garden variety trouble in crossing the mountains in the middle of January. Right. I mean, that's not a great idea under the best of times, but his emphasis here, this is not the normal trouble that you would expect crossing the mountains in the middle of January. This is very unusual. Gandalf can say all he likes that, like, he feared they would hit snow in the high passes. Aragorn is saying, I would like to point out, we're not even in the high pass yet. We're not even close to the high pass yet. We're not high yet. We're still far down. These paths are almost never snowed in at any time of year, in any year. So this is not like, ah, uh, see, like you should have foreseen the possibility of snow like I did uh, and therefore not have led us in this way. Aragorn is pointing out like this is actually more than anybody could have. This is not just as I say, garden variety, bad weather. Um, so as I say, the uncharitable reading is that Aragorn is making excuses for himself, right? But like, how could I have known? Like, it should not be this way. Like, it should be normal. I've been here many times, and normally there's no snow here, at least not that much, you know? Um, that's, uh, um, 
But I don't think that that's actually Aragorn's tone here. I think that he is making a larger point here. He, it's very much like what Aragorn said in that dell in Hollen, right? When he pointed out the silence, the unusual silence. Um, I've been in Holland in many seasons, that whole section, right? When everybody else is laughing around the campfire and he comes in and says, it's quiet, too quiet. This is similar to that. He is saying, I have been here many times and this is not, this is not within the, uh, the, you know, the boundaries of normal weather patterns here. Right. Um, any more than the eerie silence earlier on was just, you know, a kind of thing you can sometimes get in Holland um, that does not happen in Holland. And snow like this, this low down does not happen this far south. They're 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 further south now, he says. Um, and it really it really shouldn't be. Um, uh, and yes, Elrond's son were here last month while scouting. Rowan. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. And crossed in December, apparently. Um, or at the very least, late November, right? Um, which is interesting in itself, right? We, I mean, it's it's another thing that... It's easy to say, like, to cross the, like, Alpine Mountain Passes in January and say, like, that sounds insane, right? I mean, like, what do you really think are the odds of success there? Um, and we, you know, we spent a little bit of time talking about the mountain passes, but again, it's far enough south that apparently it's passable. It just was passed quite recently, um, just within the last month, month and a half, basically, well, last four to six weeks, um, the Sons of Elrond came through here. Um, so, yeah, and if there had been an unusually heavy snows there, probably they would have mentioned that, right? Probably. So... So yes, the, um, both Aragorn's general experience and what recent local intelligence they would have received um, from those final spies to return, they should have been informed of this. Right. Now, Kovia, you're right. If they handled the snow as well as Legolas, maybe it wouldn't have hurt them. I still think they'd have mentioned it. Right. Um, I don't think that they're so clueless that they would not realize that um, it would be a, it would be a problem. Um, so Aragorn is pointing out that this is not normal. And again, uncharitably, it sounds like he's sort of trying to defray responsibility for what is beginning to look like a disaster um, as they are at the very least at risk of not making it. Notice, by the way, he's also not trying to sugarcoat it. Um, while, on the one hand, his pointing to the irregularity of this storm does kind of explain why, you know, um, why his advice didn't pan out, you know what I mean? Um, but at the same time, it also... Um, He's not, what he's definitely not doing is simply being stubborn, right? He's not saying like, okay, yeah, well, you know, I said we should go over the mountains and, uh, you know, I, I, I still think that's the best idea, right? Let's just, let's just, you know, double down and keep at it. I'm sure this will pass, this will pass and we'll be fine, right? I mean, that's one very natural reaction to discovering that you might be wrong, especially when you were in a debate like that and the other person gave in to you. It's really hard to be wrong in that kind of instance, right? And so often we can respond to that by continuing to insist or to try to convince ourselves that we're still right, even when it's clearly been proven that we were wrong and we should have given in to the other person all along, right? Um, that's a very natural tendency. Aragorn is not following that tendency here. Because obviously one of the conclusions, um, if on the one hand he's saying, I'm owning up to the fact that this crossing the mountains was my idea. It was my plan, right? 
But he's also saying this crossing of the mountains that I suggested is going really badly. And in fact, we are on pace for an epic failure in that regard, right? Um, I mean, he doesn't state it explicitly, but his apart from merely the fact of showing the irregularity of this storm, the how uh, exactly how unusual this much snow at this altitude is, one of the other obvious conclusions that he invites, I think, from that is, if we're getting this much snow now, this far down, how could we possibly hope to cross the mountains? Um, this is almost certainly doomed to failure, this attempt. Um, so he's not backing away from that, right? He's not just ignoring that uh, and trying to and trying to push through that. Um, I think he is already aware of the fact that there is something else going on here, and he is not alone there. As we see, Boromir picks up on this right away. So segueing to the second part, I wonder if this is a contrivance of the enemy, said Boromir. Boromir immediately has the suggestion, hey, maybe there is a supernatural explanation of this storm. If it's that unusual, right? If we have reason to think that this is a fluke storm, which has just now arisen just in time, like timed precisely with, we, with when we are attempting to cross over, maybe that's not a coincidence. Maybe there is actually some power probably Sauron himself, who is contriving it. They say in my land that he can govern the storms in the mountains of shadow that stand upon the borders of Mordor. Now, of course, the mountains of shadow that stand upon the borders of Mordor are very far from here, as Gimli is about to point out. Not only are they very far from here, they are as Boromir characterizes it, upon the borders of Mordor. That is, they are Sauron's own mountains. They are within his lands, and so it would make a certain amount of sense that they were in some ways under his control. That he can govern storms in the Mountains of Shadow. I mean, I'm not saying that's nothing. That's like a given or simple or something like that, but it certainly is um, not shocking, right? Um, that he that the Dark Lord might be so powerful that he could control, uh, that he could control storms within his own mountains right there. What Boromir, so I don't think that Boromir is making what could be a kind of um, simple-minded connection. Well, I've heard he can make storms in the mountains of shadows, so therefore, if there are storms in, um, in mountains, pretty much anywhere on the planet, maybe it's, maybe he just, does mountain storms. Maybe he's in charge of all mountain storms everywhere around the world. But I mean, like that would be a really kind of odd, simplistic association that he's making, right? Boromir, what interests me most about this statement by Boromir is the tentativeness and, dare I say, the humility of this statement that he's making. Do you see what I mean? He doesn't charge in with his opinion. This must be a contrivance of the enemy. I wouldn't bat an eye if Boromir did say that, right? This must be a contrivance, of, but he doesn't say that. I wonder if this is a contrivance of the enemy, he says. Um, and then in his second sentence, he gives his evidence. Why, well, why would you say that, Boromir? Well, because they say in my land, and notice he's doing the they say thing, right? Like, I'm not claiming to know this. I, I'm just... I'm reporting what I've heard. It may or may not be true. They say in my land that he can govern the storms in the mountains of shadow that stand upon the borders of Mordor. Like This kind of phenomenon that we're experiencing here is something I have heard is a known thing that Sauron does over there. But I'm not making any assertions. right? I, I, I'm, just, I'm wondering. I'm, this is me brainstorming here. right? I've heard that this is a kind of thing that he can do. Could he do it out here? Who knows? Conclusion. He has strange powers and many allies. In other words, not only do I not know, you don't know either, right? What I know about Sauron is that he has unusual powers, right? 
and we don't know everything that he can do. And neither do you. So, what do we think, right? Um, he has strange powers and many allies. Gimli scoffs, right? Um, his arm has grown long indeed if he can draw snow down from the north to trouble us here 300 leagues away. Boromir, sorry, Gimli is not convinced by Boromir's suggestion. He immediately wants to pour cold water on that. That's ridiculous. His arm has grown long indeed is a like heavily sarcastic statement, right? Um... If he can draw snow down from the north to trouble us here, these 300 leagues away. Notice he's saying, like, it's not just that he can reach to here. He'd have to reach further than here, right? He'd have to reach up into the north. Remember, Aragorn has just said we're too far south for this much snow, right? So Gimli says, okay, great. So Sauron will have to go, would have to reach like 100 miles north of here and then pull that snow south to fling at us here on Karathras, you know, th which is itself 300 leagues away from where he is, right? Like, do, do we really believe that Sauron has that kind of continental power? And Gimli is scoffing at this. Pause for a second to think about Gimli's scoffing. Um, I have noticed, one trend that I have noticed in questions that I get and discussions that I've had with Tolkien fans over the years is that modern Tolkien readers tend, it seems to me, to assume that Sauron's is greater than the characters in the book assume it to be. Um, I find that very, very many, um, that very, very many of, uh, um, very many modern readers give Sauron enormous credit. Like, think he can do almost anything. Um, I won't digress into this very heavily, but one of the places where this was most pointedly on display was people talking about Sauron and Halbrand in The Rings of Power. And all I want to say about that is the fact how many fans were willing to believe that Sauron could know the future and contrive it. Um, the whole, like, he got on the boat because he somehow foreknew that he would meet Galadriel swimming back from the um, the depth of foreknowledge, the, the, the almost omniscient knowledge um, that that is ascribing to Sauron. Um, and what I kept hearing from people was, well, yeah, but he's, he's a Maya, right? Like he's this sort of semi-divine being. Um, and I don't think so, right? All of the evidence in the text suggests Sauron knows way less than most modern readers assume and can do way less. Another very common... Uh, anyways, as I'm not going to talk any more about Halbrand and the Rings of Power, but I am going to. Uh, I just I, that was it was just, it was an interesting piece of evidence in this. But like, people are like, but he's Sauron. People kept saying like, as if that explains everything. Like he can do anything. He's the Dark Lord. He can do anything. Um, and um, uh, yeah, that's that seems to me quite common. Similarly, a lot of people have been saying like, why didn't Sauron know like as soon as Frodo put on the ring like they assume he has the ability to sense the presence of the ring from a very great distance away um, and that's plainly untrue uh, that he can merely detect it um, that is to say I have often found people to assume that Sauron's power in general and connection with the ring in specific is so great that if they actually thought it through, the story wouldn't make any sense. Like, it would not be possible for Frodo even to get to Mount Doom with the ring if Sauron actually had the degree of power that a lot of people seem to suggest that he had. Um, but, um, 
in any case. Uh, yeah, uh, Bjorning uh, says, wouldn't Frodo have to actually, uh, you know, activate the ring by trying to master it in order to provoke Sauron's attention? Uh, yeah, to some extent, yes. Uh, to some extent, yes. But that works, that clearly works when he's in the Samoth Nahr itself, right? When he's in the Cracks of Doom. Um, at the center of Sauron's own power. When he claims the ring at the center of Sauron's own power, Sauron is aware of him. Um, but it is not at all clear. Like, Gandalf says that Sauron is waiting for a ring lord to emerge among them and challenge him. Gandalf will say explicitly that Aragorn marching at the head of the army, uh, announcing himself as the king, and, attack and assaulting the Black Gate... Gandalf says that he believes, that Gandalf believes, that Sauron is going to believe that Aragorn must have the ring and have claimed it. That this is the, this is the new ring lord, right? The overconfidence of the new ring lord. Um, in other words, Gandalf clearly does not believe that, that Sauron could detect it. If Aragorn did have the ring in Minas Tirith and claimed it for his own in Minas Tirith, even that close to Mordor. Gandalf does not think that Sauron would be directly aware of it, such that he could be deceived into thinking that he was trapping not only, you know, his new potential rival there at the Black Gate, but even the ring itself, that he was going to retake the ring, right, in that moment. Um, anyway, okay. So, um... As I say, Gimli's scoffing is, I think, important here. It's important to remember that Gimli thinks it laughable that Sauron could do this. Gandalf immediately pours cold water on Gimli's cold water, <laughs> right? His arm has grown long, said Gandalf. Well, crap. Gandalf, are you saying he could do that? He could reach into the north from where, from Mordor, uh, like reach from Mordor, like, and command storms in like, what, I don't know, Gundabad, right? And bring them south down the Misty Mountains just in time to strike the, the Redhorn Gate Pass, uh, like that he can see us, know that we're about to cross over, uh, gather the th storms and fling them against us. Gandalf, are you really suggesting that that's in fact what happened here it almost sounds like gandalf is suggesting that um bjorning i completely agree i don't think that gandalf knows whether sauron's responsible or not but he does seem to think that it's an option yes Almaria, i i i believe i agree with you um Let's let Sauron underestimate us, not us underestimate him, um, I think is one good way to understand what, what Gandalf is, 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 is doing here. Gandalf doesn't want them to underestimate Sauron. Exactly. Exactly. Don't underestimate him. Um, you can't overestimate him either, or else you'll despair and think it's just impossible, right, that, um, that good can prevail here. Um, but, um, but he is worried about overconfidence, about um, uh, underestimating Sauron, it seems. But I want to come back to the pivotal phrase that many of you have been pointing to, um, because I agree with you that I think that Boromir's kind of nailed it here. He has strange powers and many allies. Boromir is not just suggesting. Gimli is being a little bit inattentive here. Um, he's having a reaction, again, a very understandable reaction. Um, but Boromir's suggestion is not the sort of naive suggestion that it might seem at first. Like, you know, again, like that, that kind of simple association, naivety, right? Like, well, I hear that he can make storms in the Mountains of Shadow, so maybe he can make storms in any mountains, Right? You know, and this is a storm in a set of mountains, so maybe he did this too, right? I mean, you know, blink, blink. Sounds like a very kind of innocent, um, naive suggestion, if you see what I mean. 
Um, and Gimli's like, oh, come on, it's not the same. Um, are you telling me he can reach more than 300 leagues away to make this happen? But the thing that Gimli is overlooking is the final sentence of Boromir. He has strange powers and many allies. The strange powers would seem to fit with Gandalf. Gandalf seems to be affirming Boromir to some extent here. Yeah, he has strange powers. That is, powers that are strange to us. We do not know all that he is capable of doing. But also, he has many allies. Boromir throws that in at the end. Um, and I don't know how clear an idea Boromir has about this. But his point is not is that Sauron is power is he is powerful. He is uh, he is a force to be reckoned with, not just because of his own personal power, of what he himself with his own arm, as it were, can do. Um, but because he has many allies as well. He has servants hidden all over the place. Um, you may run into somebody who has sworn allegiance to the Dark Lord almost anywhere you go. He, at least, is clearly remembering Gandalf's story about Saruman, right? We know that one of Sauron's many allies is Saruman, the white former leader of the White Council, um, whose arm would have to be substantially less far. Right? I'm not saying that it's Saruman, um, but I'm saying that if it were, that would require a little bit less um, as he's relatively close to where they are, right? Um, so he doesn't, Sauron doesn't have to be able to muscle snowstorms uh, you know, uh, you know, south uh, and time them uh, and everything from where he's sitting in Mordor. All he has to do is send a message, right? All he has to do is uh, nudge uh, one of his um, one of his allies to do it. Now, trifle, I hear that objection. Um, I'm not sure I'd put Saruman neatly in the category of ally to Sauron either. Not from his perspective. Saruman's perspective, I mean. Saruman doesn't, you know, and Gandalf said this, right? That he uh, is um, uh, in rivalry and not in service to Sauron yet. But what do you think about Boromir? Um, I think Boromir will have put Saruman in the class of Sauron's ally. Like, might as well be, right? Um, the distinction between, like, is Saruman, is, is Saruman still in it for himself, or is he, you know, uh, loyally serving Sauron as his vassal, is, I think, a distinction that Boromir's not going to really care about. Like, Saruman is now a bad guy, clearly, right? Um, he is in league with Sauron in one sense or another. Um, and I suspect... That yeah, Boromir's thinking in two sides. Uh, yeah, exactly, Trifle. That's just that it's that Boromir would be thinking in terms of like there's us and them, right? We have our allies. He has his allies, right? Um, that make up the two different sides. So he's already put you know just as he has Rohan. Well, there's like the southern fiefs of Gondor, which are not exactly allies, but anyway, there's Gondor, um, which includes its southern fiefs and Belfalos and everything else. Um, then there's Rohan, right? They're in their list of allies. Uh, but unfortunately, Sauron has a longer list of allies, right? He's got the Easterlings and the Southrons, and now apparently Saruman too. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Graham says Boromir mentally classifies everyone as stab or don't stab. Yeah, kind of. I mean, he is thinking like a general. He's thinking like a war. Are these, um, if I meet them in battle, which side are they going to be on? My side or my enemy's side, right? Um, and uh, clearly from what he's heard, Saruman is not going to be on his side. So, ergo, ally of Mordor close enough. And of course, he's not totally wrong. He's not totally wrong. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Notice, though, this is quite a subtle thing for Boromir to say. This is, this is, this is Boromir being really good, right? Not just um, really tactful, but really perceptive as well. Um, he's being a good deal more perceptive than Gimli is. Um, Gimli is thinking much more simplistically in terms of Sauron's own power. Could he do this? Could he be responsible for this snowstorm? And that sounds like superstition, doesn't it? What are we saying? He made it snow here? 300 leagues away? He just like snapped his fingers and made it snow? Even Sauron can't do that. But that's not what Boromir suggested. That he has both strange powers, but also many allies. Um, for many years, Jackie, I also read it that way. As we Gondorians believe he can control the weather, so duh. You know, weather is against us, it's probably Sauron. Yeah, in other words, making it sound... Um, making it sound like superstition, right? Which seems to be what leads Gimli to scoff, right? Um, like, oh, so Sauron is like the weather boogeyman now? Really? Like, that's where... That's how we're gonna. That's how we're gonna be. Um, but again, I don't think that that's what Boromir is suggesting. Um, Boromir is saying, "A, it is said. I'm not necessarily saying that it's true, but I'm reporting the fact that people in our country do say that controlling storms in the mountains is a thing that he can do. Weather control is in his power." Point number one. Point number two. He has strange powers. We don't understand everything that he can do. Point number three. He has many allies. So even far away from his mountains upon the borders of Mordor, he might be able to have influence. And since we know, point A, that weather control is a thing that he does, who knows? Who knows? Um, Gandalf's Gandalf doesn't agree with Boromir, right? He doesn't confirm Boromir's guess. But it's pretty clear that Gandalf is not ruling it out. You'd think if he were, he'd have said a little bit more, right? Instead, he quashes Gimli, not Boromir. His arm has grown long. Gandalf, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible for me to read that as anything less than Gandalf saying, there is not a 0% chance. The odds that Sar Sauron is causing this storm are not zero. It is possible. It is possible. His arm has grown long. If anything, it seems like an affirmation of the strange powers thing. Right? Strange powers. Um... And many allies. We don't yet have in this passage clear evidence as to what is directly the cause of the storm. I think I think it's the mountain. Um, is Karathras the mountain? himself, now one of Sauron's own allies. Well, we don't know for sure. And I don't think, by the way, that Boromir is suggesting that, necessarily. I don't think that Boromir knows enough about this mountain in particular, maybe not about mountains in general. We've never seen Boromir, I mean, we haven't seen him say that much, but we certainly have no evidence that he sort of personifies mountains in this way. Gimli does. Right? Gimli is going to be personifying the mountains pretty strongly. Um, so we've seen that tendency beginning. Um, but I don't see any necessary reason to believe that when he says he has strange powers and many allies, Boromir is hinting, I think, this mountain is in league with the enemy. When you say that out loud, 
it sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? Right. Um, like if um, if the other statement, Sauron can control the weather. So anytime there's bad weather, it's probably Sauron. Sounds like superstition. Right. Um, to say, I think this mountain is conspiring with the Dark Lord against us sounds insane. Right. Um, but I don't think it is insane. I think it's pretty clear that the mountain is beyond being personified, but we're not quite there yet. Um, we're not quite there yet. I want to close the loop. We'll get a little bit more of that next time. Um, more of the direct. So this was, in part, this was a setup. I do think in the end, an extension of Boromir's suggestion. That is, that Sauron does have many allies, and one of them might very well be Karathras himself, either directly or indirectly, does seem to me to be the best way to read this whole sequence here. Um, and this is the beginning of setting that up, uh, I think, in some pretty important ways. Well, the other way is that we've all, the way that Karathras has already begun to be personified. Um, but I want to finish one other thing before we leave this passage. And thinking about, so we've been talking about Gandalf's final statement, his arm has grown long, in the context, like as a response to Gimli, like in relationship to Gimli and Boromir's exchange there. But I also want to look at how it serves. Gandalf didn't get a word in after Aragorn said his piece, right? Because Boromir interjected. He doesn't exactly interrupt, right? But he does interject. Um, and thus we don't really get a completion of Gandalf and Aragorn's exchange. What do you say now, Aragorn, that I feared it too, but less than other things? What's Gandalf going to say to that? Um, his arm has grown long, Gandalf says. Um, the decision the decision about whether to go to try the mountain pass, to try the Gap of Rohan, or to go through Moria. These are the really the only three, I was going to say the only three realistic options on the table, except Aragorn argues they're not all three of them realistic options, right? Um, and of course, one of the things that Aragorn is reminding him uh, in saying, I knew the risk of snow, is that it is not the case that Gandalf and Aragorn have been arguing about this, and Aragorn's like, it's fine, let's take the pass, it's going to be awesome. In fact, I'm sure we'll enjoy it. It's beautiful this time of year, right? It's not like Aragorn has been naive about this. Aragorn, from the start, has been like, this sucks, and it's going to suck worse <laughs> as we go on, right? Um, I think crossing over the mountains is going to be horrible. The only argument to be made in its defense is that it is far less horrible than any other option. Um, so, to some extent, Gan uh, Aragorn is here kind of um, uh, kind of repeating, right, uh, the claims that he had made before. Um, now, um, Yeah, I see. So, Emin Moto says, I've always read Gimli as displaying an increased leeriness of the seriousness of the situation, not being dismissive. Well, dismissive might be too much, but I think there is some sarcasm here. Um, I agree with you that he's definitely displaying leeriness of the situation. No question. But I will say, it seems actually a little counterintuitive to me that Gimli would make this claim. Um, you'd think, for instance, that Gimli's reaction to this would be from the beginning, oh, man, that's Karathras all over, isn't it? Right? We have legends about this bloody mountain, um, and it's, like, been no end of trouble. Um, but that's not what he says. That's not his first reaction. 
he is repeating, building off of what Aragorn said. It doesn't almost ever, it almost never snows this much down here. Um, the paths are usually open all the winter. And Gimli's like, it, he must have, notice his statement is premised upon the idea that someone has to have drawn snow down from the north where it would normally be snowing, but it's not snowing down here. Um, Gimli doesn't blame Carothras. He might do. It would fit, right? But he, that's not where he goes with this at all. So that's another reason why I do think there is... I, I, d dismissive might be too strong. Um, but... But I do think it's in that direction, the tone of Gimli's, Gimli's tone, though. Um... Yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, but back to Gandalf here. How does Gandalf's comment there serve as response? It seems to me, it seems to me like a kind of acknowledgement of what Aragorn has said. I mean, he's explicitly reacting. He's quoting Gimli. You know, his arm has grown long. Um, so obviously he's responding. I'm not trying to pretend he's not responding to Gimli, but like, again, in what way does this kind of close the loop on that little exchange between Aragorn and Gandalf? Um, and it does seem to be... Like Aragorn has said there is something... This storm is either a freak coincidence or it is of malicious intent and aimed to stop us going over the mountains. There is either malice or freak coincidence involved in this storm. This is not normal. Just like the silence in Holland, this is not normal. Aragorn has insisted. And Gandalf's reply, his arm has grown long, right, in responding to what Gimli just said, shows which one Gandalf suspects it is. Gandalf is... I think that what Gandalf is communicating to Aragorn here is... Okay. Remember how I said the weather might be a, 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 you know, a worse enemy than any? Well, bad news. Maybe the weather is only a tool of our enemy. Um, maybe we're already discovered. Maybe the enemy knows we're going this way. If, as you say, Aragorn, we should not be, you know, this snow is too, um, uh, you know, that, that, that this, this snow is, is too unseasonal, too strange. We have to assume that it has been deliberately thrown on us and that it is not just a freak coincidence. Um, Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, Bjorning, exactly. I think that... Because, again, we know more context here than Gimli and Boromir and the rest of them do, right? We know the debate they've already been having. We know the thing that they're talking about without mentioning it because Aragorn begged Gandalf not to mention it. Right. Um, Aragorn has already alluded to the unspoken thing less than other things. Right. Um, you know, Ixne on the Oria May. Right. Don't mention Moria. And Gandalf is, I think, looking straight at Aragorn and saying his arm has grown long. So, Aragorn, maybe the only way to avoid the long arm of Sauron is to go underground here, to go in a way that nobody anticipates to go to the one place that may actually be out of his reach. Or, you know, right into, you know, the, dra the dragon's den, as it were. It's not a dragon's den. Uh, it's, uh, but Balrog's den. Do Balrogs have dens? Like, where do they hang out in a Balrog cave? Is a Balrog cave like a man cave? And if so, how? All these things I wonder. Um, but anyway, Lair, 
Could be Lair. The Balrog's Hearth. Yeah, possible. And an Orc Stronghold for certain. Fort Thalmas, exactly. Exactly. Um, but uh, it's a man-sized cave. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Of man shape, perhaps. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyhow, anyhow. <laughs> Never mind. The point is, I do think that Gandalf is suggesting his arm has grown long, I think, as a kind of a rider, right? Um, so, Aragorn, let me add this to the list of my counter arguments against going over the mountains, right? Um, he was worried about exposure. He was worried about not exposure in the sense of freezing to death, though that's a very real danger, but exposure in the sense of being discovered. That's what he was saying to them, right? You know, uh, in his discouraging speech that we just looked at um, in the previous class when he says, so the bad news is that um, we're probably going to be, you know, we may well be exposed to the enemy on the high pass. We may be seen um, and discovered. Um, oh, and also we might die of exposure. Right, so there's also that. Um, now he is kind of doubling down on that and saying, there's not just a risk of exposure here. This storm, by your own observations, Aragorn, suggests Sauron, or one of his allies, already knows that we're here. Now, I saw somebody asking... Um, I saw somebody asking what would be the goal? Like, why would Sauron throw a snowstorm at them? Um, does he want the ring to get lost in the snow? Um, no, I don't think so. But, um, but I think he wants to turn them back. Um, <laughs> thank you, Praise. Praise has posted a picture of the You Have Died of Exposure screen from the Oregon Trail. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Fortunately, nobody in the company of the ring seems to be at much risk of dying of dysentery. And that, I think we can all allow, is a relief for everyone, so to speak. So anyway, um, yes. So <laughs> why would Sauron want to prevent them crossing the mountains? Because he has them trapped. Because he has them trapped. Um, what would be... Put on your Sauron hat. I assume you all have Sauron hats. Put on your Sauron hat and ask yourself, why would they try to take the ring over the Red Horn Gate? What's the plan? If you're taking the ring, he knows they have the ring in Rivendell. They believe in Rivendell that he's going to be sending it, that they're going to be sending it to the sea, right? But surely there's a non-zero chance that they're going to try to send it. Yeah, exactly. Um, as Abelard says, clearly Sauron's deepest and greatest fear is that it will fall into the hands of his greatest, most powerful, most lethal and terrifying enemy, Celeborn. Yeah, exactly. Um, but no, I, yeah, I mean, obviously, we, we all know that it would be Galadriel. Um, he would be incentivized to keep them out of Lorien, I think. Um, why do we mock Celeborn? Because it's fun, Rowan. I probably shouldn't, uh, Rowan, but I I can't help it. Um, I Maybe I should try to help it, but um, I keep getting encouraged by... I blame... I blame all the rest of you who keep egging me on in this because it's so easy. Yeah, no, it is. It is. Um... We'll get there. We'll get. My hope is, when we get to Lorien, a careful look at Celeborn will inspire an inc the kind of increased respect. I honestly feel like I I have gained a significantly increased respect for Boromir through our study so far. And I am not without hope that um, my esteem for Celeborn shall increase similarly when we get to Lorien. Um, uh, yeah, Mad Violinist says, uh, uh, yes, but the hope is faint. I hear you. I hear you. 
Um, but um, <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Tis but a fool's hope. Yeah, it has been called so. Agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah, I, 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 Terry Bites on Twitch says Kelborn has the best name. Well, yes, Kelborn is a great name. Unfortunately, he was saddled with possibly the worst name in the entire uh, Legendarium in the early drafts, um, which Tolkien mercifully changed, which was Teleporno. Teleporno was his original name, um, which was changed to Celeborn. Um, no, Trotter was a far more dignified name than Teleporno, uh, I have to say. Um, but, yes, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there. Um, so, um, anyhow, anyway, okay. So, more on Celeborn later on. The point is, does it make sense that Sauron would... If he had such me measures indeed at his disposal as very strong storms in the past to prevent, to close the pass, essentially. Um, if he could close the pass at will when it looked like the, you know, the ring might be being taken over the mountain, would he do it? Absolutely, he would do it. Absolutely, he would do it. I mean, I, I, you got to think so, right? Let's keep the ring away from Galadriel. Yeah. Um, uh, if he thought that um, um, if he thought that if he thought that Goadriel were um, the, the strongest of his foes most likely to be able to overthrow him he would be right if he thought Goadriel were the one of his foes who was most likely to take up the ring and attempt to oust him he would be right so yeah all kinds of good reasons for him to want to keep the ring out of Goadriel's hands um yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes. Um, oh, Arden Crayon, I pronounced Celeborn with a soft C for years when I was a kid. Yeah, that was one of the first um, pronunciation errors I corrected uh, many years ago. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I did, I did for many years. I was, in fact, strongly resistant to the idea of pronouncing them as hard Cs. Um, very resistant for a long time. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Philar says, I think for all of us, it was baby's first mispronunciation. It's a very natural one to make. Um, uh, and, you know, and I, I think it's interesting. I'm doing much better with Gilgalad. Thank you. I've been practicing. I've been trying. See, look at that. Um, uh, you can't say, even if you dislike the Rings of Power show. You can't say it's done no good because here it is. Um, it has driven me to start pronouncing Gilgalad's name correctly. So there we go. Good has come of it. Good in my life anyway. Um, Arden Cran, and I think you're right, by the way. I think that um, the word celery is quite likely, though I never thought of it. Um, probably the word that most influenced me uh, when I was a kid, in how the word celeborn should be pronounced, because, you know, looks very similar. And celebrate, yeah, there you go. Um, we have, uh, yeah, we have lots of uh, uh, words that start like that. Um, it's the same problem with Celtic, Gildalowin. Right, says the native of the Boston area who has grown up a Boston Celtics fan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Yep, yep. Um, that sh surely didn't help, right? Um, uh, anyway, okay. But next time we will look at... The interesting thing is that after this conversation, they're not going to stop. They're not stopping and turning around. They're going to keep going for a little while after this. This is only the first check, as Pippin said wryly to Mary uh, in the Old Forest. Um even though, like that first check, it was an indicator. Right, this is an indicator that this is not going to work. Just as the first check that they experienced in the old forest was, in fact, just as Pippin was implying, um, a sign that Mary was, in fact, going to get them lost. Um, but um, 
Yeah. Anyway, okay. Um, we will end our book discussion there for the day. It is field trip time. Thanks for those of you who uh, are joining us just for a book discussion. And uh, I will... We will... We will resume our field trip. We're continuing to look at the brand new area. To, to, uh, uh, we're exploring Old Cardolan, which is really exciting. Thanks, everybody, for joining me tonight. And let's see if I can get things together here. Uh, that's what I thought. Okay, give me a second. Doing my one obligatory crash here. Aranas, that's a really great question. What was that? Sorry, Aranas was just asking a really great question. So I don't understand why people think that Sauron would think that the free people would pass the ring on voluntarily to a more powerful opponent. Um, so the assumption that they would send it to Galadriel. Um, uh, like, why would they not claim it for themselves? Like, why would they be like, oh, no, I don't want the ring. Let's give it to Galadriel. I hear that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I, it would make sense that Sauron wouldn't get that, although it does seem to follow in a lot of uh, folklore, histories, etc., where everyone says we have to have a king, though. Who are we going to have for our king? Right. You know, because responsibilities and stuff. So yeah. Well, I'm I thinking think part, here. That part would make sense. Right. I'm thinking here that he might not necessarily... Um, he might not necessarily assume Aranos that they're coming there in order to hand it off to Galadriel peaceably. Hmm. What would Sauron do, right? He would. If Sauron were in the Council Galadriel, of Elrond, he would claim lost. the ring for himself. Yeah. And then he would immediately put down any rivals. Right? Yeah. Any rival yeah. claimants. Which means... Uh, we're, we're, we're talking current crusty Sauron, not wheedling Anatar kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Third Age Sauron. Third Age Sauron would claim the ring for himself, and then he would... Exactly, well, he would consolidate his power. Yeah. Um, uh, so, if he... Therefore, if he were them, like if he were Elrond... He would take the ring, and then he would go south, and he'd go through Lorien, and he'd defeat Galadriel, because you can't just leave her there, right? Oh, yeah. So. That's true, but I think some of them's also saying, you know, it probably fell into the hands of some stupid farmer or some sissy little archer or something like that, someone who knows they can't defeat me, so they're going to take it to my my age-old foe and say oh please protect us and we'll you know let's, right we'll maybe they're everything. going to get her help to ask her to go fetch it or something yeah, yeah I mean, and it's true rns like they might be he might well think that like you know the confrontation between whoever has it gandalf elrond whatever whoever's claimed the ring of power and then goes up against galadriel galadriel might take him right in which case then yeah. she gets the ring so like one way or another it's a bad lookout. Either they conquer Galadriel and then they, like, you know, whatever, have her power, right? Or at least, like, they've taken her out um, and they're now stronger. Um, or the, or Galadriel takes it and now she's got it. And now, like, that's big trouble. Yeah. Um, so, when, again, I don't think that he has to assume that they're going to, like, come, you know, bearing the ring on, like, a pillow, you know. And carrying it to uh, her. But. Yeah, I think ultimately his his thoughts are probably the same as ours at this point, which is re, you know Redhorn and Carathros is just the farthest away from Isengard. Yeah. Which, you know he stupidly showed his hand already. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah that's just logic at that point. Right. 
Right. Okay, hey, let's head back to um, the convoy here. Gerwin's convoy in Cardolan. All right, sounds good. Right. Arnaz says, better to direct the ring to the Gap of Rohan where his lapdog is. Possibly. Though I can't imagine that Sauron would be enormously excited to have Saruman getting the ring, either. Yeah, or Krima, or, or any of those... I, yeah, I well, especially Saruman. Like, Saruman believes that if he gets the ring, he could take Sauron. Now, he might yeah. be wrong about that, right? You know, Sauron might have a very different opinion on that subject. Uh, Sauron might have even planted some of those ideas in his head, knowing that it'd be easy to... Conceivably. Conceivably. To crack um, oh, and I agree, Trifle. I think that the fact that Goadriel has one of the elven rings is like the worst-kept secret in Middle-earth. It's the um, most popular best kept secret. Yeah, if ever if ever there was a if ever there was a an open secret in Middle Earth, it's gotta be that Galadriel has one of the rings. Um We don't talk yeah. about yen yeah, no no. Yeah. No. I agree with you, Trifle. I, I think that Saruman would have a chance if he got the ring. I I, I, I do. I think we couldn't underestimate Sar Saruman. But okay, field trip tonight. We are headed to Sarch Vorn. I want to see what's up there. There looked like there were some really sweet, very old ruins up there. And I want to get the lay of the land here. Plus, we're going... So that's Bree right there. That's the boundary of Bree. Yep. Which means I think we're headed like right up the hill over this way. This is not the way. Why not? Yeah, the we're following druids on this one. Oh yeah, where is where where are we going then? We have to go through the town. Which town, Bree? No, no, no. We have to go through the the door in and out. Really? Yep. We can't just go there's up the a, hill. Well, you can and drop down, yes, but I started getting there, there by accident before. Yeah, there there's a a rather large place that you'll get stuck in the landscape if you go straight north from this city. Okay. There's an intended path where you go through the city and then across the river and around the way. Okay, but aren't we going away from it now? Sort of, because the path goes down and around, unfortunately. Down and around. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we're okay. talking about Sar Sauron's allies, though, and the personification of Karabras, right? Yeah. So it yes. begs the question, what would you offer a mountain to get it on your side? It is an interesting question. It is an interesting question. Oh, by the way, so Druid's Fire, I like yes, coming this way because mm -hmm. we are in we are more clearly in the context of that men here we were looking at mm -hmm. which is right up around this we're not still not quite around as far as it was but that standing yep. stone was over here so we can begin to see sort of the extension of it I'm trying to so remember even though where the, I'd actually even see. though the flag on my map is straight 180 degrees behind where I'm going right now I am interested to see this approach to it mm-hmm I'm trying to find the actual path where I'd seen it before, so give me just a okay. moment. No worries. Somebody has me directly on follow. This is a cliff. And what's, is that the old forest down there? It yeah, is yeah. the old forest. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I see. It's all misty. It's part of the problem. All through the landscape. Yeah, because that's always happened before. All okay. right, I'm still trying to find my path. And now I'm falling down, down through the landscape. That's amazing. Okay, now notice oh, that we yeah. have... We have the blight in place here. We got the what is the what is that ghostly figure? That's different from what we saw in the castle. Uh, Wandering Barrow Keeper? Spirit. Yeah, Wandering okay. Barrow Spirit. So he's not in fact an oathbreaker, though he looks like yeah. one. Mm -hmm. He's dressed as one, you see. Um, but he's associated with the barrows, which are indeed nearby. In fact, the sort of village that we're looking for is... Ooh. 
Oh, it's a oh. waterfall. Okay. Oh, fun. And there's a bridge across the waterfall, so there's a bridge you can Rivendell, Corey. Oh, the there we go. Oh, oh yes. there, yeah, that's exciting. Too. Went too far south. Missed my corner. Can we go to it up this way? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think it goes down there, right? There we are. Come on. Come on. Okay. Uh, Whoa. Um, big rock outcrop. Yeah. All right. Oh and boy. we're still seeing no sign of construction. I mean, apart from the bridge. Like, of stone construction. I'm looking for... <laughs> that skeleton came up there and was just about to cross and then was just like, no way, man. You can't make me cross that. I'm dead and I ain't going. Yeah, I just turned and ran. Huh, who built this bridge? There's a dead body over here. Oh, you think that's who built the bridge? Are you the bridge builder? I don't think he's very chatty. No. Huh. The um, bridge would have to be new, though. No way it could withstand all this water. Yeah, no, it's clearly new. I mean, it's not, um, it's not. It's not dwarf make. Look at that no. shoddy construction. No, I mean, it's, and the only thing we've seen apart, so, I mean, even if this can't even be from Cardolan, it would be a thousand years old. Oh, um, yeah, no, they don't have compressed okay. arsenic treated wood to withstand this kind of weather. Yeah, no way. But, well, let's see if we get any, uh. Any evidence there? Oh, the heather and lavender. <laughs> so pretty. Okay. So this is a path. So this, what we have here, is a path which extended from the old ruins, right? Mm, yeah, we're in the old forest now, the southern part. All right. So now we've wound around and we're headed back to the north. Yes. We keep coming up upon these big flat places, but I, that looks like just natural rock formations. Uh-huh. I'm still not seeing any evidence of construction or carvings anywhere. Now entering Sarkborn. <gasps> cool! Ooh. A uh, secret ruin. Born. The Black Grave, huh? Okay, hang on now. Uh, what are we looking so cool. at here? Oh, Arnorian, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so this looks like the secret tomb. So this is the uh, this is the Rathdenan of Cardolan, then. Yeah, I guess so. Something like that? Yeah, this looks like where we, you know, like in the the, the swaps up in, uh, nor, um, where is it? The is it Lonelands? Or something like that? The, the little, like a Gartha Garwin or something like that. The, the sort of red swamps or something up there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Except those, those were Rudawan, I believe. But yes, they were. Yes, they were. Um, okay, hang on a second. I'm trying to see in without going in yet. Inside we can see an open field with reeds and what looks like, what is that, an altar? Maybe. It's like a crematorium. But... Yeah, possibly. Can't rule it out, I guess. Mm. Though we don't think the people of Cardolan practice cremation. Both yeah. given the way that Denethor speaks of funeral pyres. 
um, as being alien to Numenorean culture. Ah. And because we know that the people of Cardolan are buried in the Barrows, so that was apparently in the Barrow Downs, so that was apparently, they were apparently burying. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and this is definitely not the old tribal stuff that yeah. we see um, the, the not yeah. and the well, which is what I saw before. Can can we get in? Do we need a quest to get in? Um, no, you can get in as long as you're level 20 or higher, but the thing is we're in a raid, uh, and it's a six-person instance. Oh, it's an instance? Yes. Oh, it's the new instance that. that just came out. Oh. Okay. Huh. So you could uh, drop out of the raid and, like, organize... You know, five other people to go with you, and then you can go in. Want to take a quick peek? Well, instances aren't usually very quick peeks in my experience, and we're already running. Late. <laughs> I have an idea. Let's let's go around the other way. Okay. Because this is very interesting, and I want to explore this more. But this isn't what I saw. What I was looking for. I mean, it, it kind of is what I was looking for, in that it is Sarkborn. Wait, this is the wrong way. This is the way, right? Yeah. Okay. Because there was like a path and everything. Okay. You go back around the corner. Second chance to Rivendell the bridge. Second chance to Rivendell the bridge. Though, I was going to say, but I'm not on my war steed. As if it was usually on my war steed that I Rivendell the bridges in Rivendell. Oh, yeah. Totally made it. Well done. Well done. There weren't railings on that thing or anything. I know. I know. Very impressive. Hey, You've there we go. a long way. There's Gildalowin. Okay. Um... So, uh, yikes! I've fallen into a pit. Um, can we oh. get back up there? Can we back up where we came? Is this is this the way up? Like, can we get up this way? No. Should be able to. Can't get Maybe up there. not. This way. This way seems okay. This way, okay. There we go. Somebody is jingling very festively too. <laughs> yes. I think okay. It's Valori's elk. All right, I wanna. I, so I wanna head back up because when when we were just exploring this hill the other time, I stumbled upon an interesting ruin. And that's when the the map flag appeared that said I was in Sarkborn, and it was when yep. I went this way. I was like, oh yep. hey look, it's the yep, old forest. Is, Let's see yeah, what's in the old forest. All, all the old graves. Yes, the really really old stones, right here, yeah. right here. I was there. They are. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. This is also Okay. But this is not the same architecture. Once again, they just moved in and made it their own, didn't they? Now this is really this is probably a tomb, right? And this tree has got to be newer than that tomb. Oh, absolutely. This tree is taken Even though over. It's a very ancient tree, but. Well, the the trees around here are pretty temperamental. Right. Yeah, the tree don't care. Um, Whew, that rubber banding. All right, can we get in? Can we can't get any further this way? I don't know. <clears throat> Not intentionally. I was ah, sure. Okay. I was I, sure I, I saw. I was sure that I had seen a swirly rock, like a rock with one I of those. Had... Yeah, me too. Swirls on it. There's the little standing stones. Which, like the men here on the other side, is uh, again clearly from that other more ancient culture. Yeah. Is that down over here more? No. Uh, oh, it's over here. It's over here where I am. You can't get in, but you can see it. Oh, you found it? Yeah, over here. You can just see. You, got, you really got to stick your head in, so I'm going to get out so you can see better. Okay, wait, where are you? 
Standing up a beacon. Oh, you got a beacon? Yeah, uh oh, I always keep them on hand now. Oh, there we go. I've got to get more of these. Oh, right, this thing down there is a ceiling. Yeah, but you you could sort of stick your head there and you can see it, but you can't go in. Aha, further, right? yes, there it is. There's the curly cues I was looking for. Yes, that's the one I saw the last time we were down here. Yes. Okay. Yes, that curly cue pattern which is so characteristic of the most ancient of the decorations of that what we have always from the beginning assumed to be the earliest layer, right, archaeologically speaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. Okay, Nern Kellyon, which one, which, which of these dots are you? Oh, you're all the way over there. He says there's also graves on him where he is. Really? So I'm going to make his way over to him while you observe. Okay. All right, no, I think I got that. And I think that this that thing here is the roof of another one of those tombs. Yep, like I think so. This flat part down here, I think, is is because you can see, you can just see it. Yeah, there it is. You uh -huh. can just see like the lintel right here. Pretty sure. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you can wow. just see it. How did you get in there? Me? No, sorry, it's on Kellyan. None Kellyan. Oh, I'm stuck. Okay. Yeah. Cut out. Really in Ooh. there? I don't know how you get in there. Interesting. Okay. So we are seeing that inside here, and maybe we'll be able to see some more of this from the, you know, the main door side of it. Uh-huh. Um, so maybe next time we'll try an instance. We'll, 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 we'll go and do the instance. Might as well explore while we're here. Yep. Um, and, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, he was on the southern Andrest approach. Okay, okay, okay. I see. I see. Okay, right, going all the way around the other side. Okay, yeah. cool. Cool. Interesting. Okay, so we can see, we can already see that there's going to be at least two different archaeological layers, right? Um, yeah. In some places, like up in Angmar, we were consistently looking at what looked like three different archaeological layers. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what's going to be lacking here is the third and modern one. In Angmar, we were always looking at the most ancient cultures, like pre-establishment of Angmar, and then the old Angmar culture, um, which, you know, died out over a thousand years ago, and then yeah. the new Angmar revival uh, architecture that had mm -hmm. sprouted up since. There doesn't seem to be any revival level here. So, so far, we've identified two different layers of architecture. The ancient dwellers of the land, like in that men here and in these tombs down here and then the Arnorians the people of Cardolan um, obviously who built Doran Ernil and equally obviously that entrance um, into uh, Sarkvorn um, so next time we will do the Sarkvorn instance if we can and uh, are not prevented and we will um, exactly Angmar Nouveau that was that was it that was it um, <laughs> Uh, and, yeah, and so we will, we will see what we can see inside Sarkvorn there. That sounds really interesting. And then after that, we will continue. Oh, every time I look at this map, it just fills me with happiness of how <laughs> big it is and how much we have to explore. Oh, I'm so excited. I feel like this new, exp this new ex expansion is going to keep us in field trips for like two years. Which is good because we got, you know, a lot coming up. <laughs> yeah, because so. I want to go... I want to head down to uh, the Brandywine. I want to see. Oh, I'm blanking. What's there's Sarn Fort is down there, of course, which I do oh, want to yeah. see. But um, it is. What's the name of the town? I'm forgetting the name of the town. Um, Hayes End. Hayes End. Yeah, down at the end of the um, of the river. It's probably that's probably further north of here. But anyway. Um, yeah, so I want to see Sarn Ford. I want to. I want to kind of explore around the end of the 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 river there. Yeah, cool. Okay, all right. Plenty to do. Of course, yeah. soon there was gonna be plenty to do anyway because we were gonna get to Moria and be able to explore all of Moria while we do Moria oh. in the text discussion. Yeah, there's that. So, 
we've gone from like uh, famine to feast here in terms of uh, uh, terrain to explore in our field trip. Uh, it'll be fine. But um, we'll, it'll be fine. we'll see what we can the do. All right. Awesome. Thank you guys for helping me to uh, search the woods and uh, figure things out here tonight. Um, I appreciate your help. Thanks for joining me on my field trip, and we will see you guys again next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.